Welcome to Impact Unicorns, the podcast where you meet inspirational entrepreneurs building the next generation of transformative companies. And now, here is your host, Dr. Indranil Ghosh, award-winning author, investor, and advisor to global leaders. Hello and welcome to this episode of Impact Unicorns. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Derek Sutherland to the show. Derek is the co-founder and CEO of CT Fusion, a company developing magnetic nuclear fusion reactors to be ready for deployment as early as the 2030s. CT Fusion's reactor design could generate 100 megawatts of clean, steady baseload power with a spatial footprint of a large supermarket. If realized, fusion reactors could be the perfect distributed energy solutions to complement the intermittent energy produced by wind and solar power. Even as a schoolboy, Derek was always fascinated in magnetism and plasmas and has pursued this lifelong passion, studying nuclear science and engineering at MIT followed by a PhD in the University of Washington. He has worked in both the public and private sectors of the fusion industry, with stints at the Los Alamos National Laboratories, as well as companies like General Fusion and General Atomics. Derek, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Great to be here. Thank you. Well, I'm really excited about this uh, conversation. First of all, first time we have uh, someone from my alma mater, MIT, on the show. So... uh, (laughs) already a point of a connection and familiarity, um, but also uh, super excited to be talking about fusion, which some people think is you know, still decades away, it's something that's from science fiction, but you and you know, community of other people in the fusion space are, are making it happen. So I'm really excited to hear about uh, what you've been doing, uh, what CT Fusion, your company, uh, is, is up to and how we're perhaps much closer than we think to clean fusion energy. So the way I start these uh, conversations, though, is, is really to sort of get to know you a little bit better uh, and let the audience sort of understand your journey, where you've come from, you know, how you got to CT Fusion and how you became an entrepreneur, particularly in such an interesting impact area like uh, fusion energy. So tell us a little bit about Derek Sutherland. How does the story begin? Sure. Absolutely. Um, so my name is Derek Sutherland. I'm the co-founder and CEO of CT Fusion. So my background is quite technical. I'm a nuclear engineer and I'm a physicist. I uh, began with my double major at MIT in those two fields. And then I continued on to get my PhD at the University of Washington in Seattle, actually in aeronautics and astronautics. But I've always been very much focused in plasma physics and fusion energy. Um, effectively since high school, which is when I really got interested in this field in the first place. And so going back a little bit further, I've always had a fascination with science. I was kind of obsessed as a, as a child with weather and meteorology. And when I encountered electromagnetism in high school, I fell in love with that branch of physics as well. And so I was looking for something that would combine the physics of weather and the physics of e together. And that coincidentally, is fusion energy science, in particular, magnetic fusion energy science. And related to that, you know, growing up in Florida, I got to see firsthand the power of hurricanes. And I know that as the planet warms, they will get stronger, as any heat engine would do. Mm. Um, and so I wanted to have a favorable impact within my line of interest. And so I really saw fusion as this cross-cutting um, approach for my career where I could satisfy my intellectual interest while also having a favorable impact on the world by helping address climate change. Oh, phenomenal. Well, you really have a passion and a love of of science, clearly. Um, Tell us a little bit more about how meteorology and magnetism has a bearing on fusion, because maybe this is an intuitive way of understanding what you actually mean by fusion energy and how it's produced. Sure. So the way to think about meteorology and in fact, just the atmosphere, how weather uh, happens, it's basically just fluid mechanics. It's the study of how fluids flow in space. And you think about how mass flows, energy flows, and 
wind flows velocity of that fluid. Um, and that physics actually is not that different than how we think of plasmas, which are ionized gases that also exhibit the same type of behaviors as fluids, but with the added uh, interest of ENM. And so you actually have this case where you have electromagnetism coupling with fluid mechanics. And that is the basis for magnetic fusion energy, which is one of the most developed and leading approaches to fusion on Earth today. Outstanding. And yeah, tell us a little bit about your journey, because what you've said so far is, you know, your academic uh, achievement, uh, your research, your, your love of, of this field. And I know that you, you know, researched at Los Alamos as well and right. many other leading um, sort of research organizations. But how did that passion evolve into a company, CT Fusion, that you're currently the CEO of? That's great. Um, so I originally came from a, a family of small business owners, and we were self-employed individuals. And so that entrepreneurial spirit has kind of been instilled in me from, from birth. Um, and then during my undergraduate career at MIT, I spent my summers as an intern at various uh, groups around the country. And I worked at Los Alamos as my first internship ever in fusion. I worked at General Fusion Incorporated in Canada, which is a private fusion company. Then I also got to work at General Atomics down in San Diego on the large scale tokamak uh, fusion device down there. And so I got to kind of taste a lot of different types of groups, um, private, public, and everywhere in between. And coupling mm -hmm. that with a with a really a small business motivation, it really propelled me forward to build a business around this so we could effectively take the strengths of this wonderful scientific foundation we've built up over decades and marry it with this entrepreneurial spirit where it can move much faster uh, than you could think in, in the public sector, but also focus it on commercialization and getting this product onto the grid as soon as possible. So that's really what gave me the impetus to form a company, is I see it as the best vehicle to get fusion onto the grid as soon as possible. Yeah, uh, that commercial endpoint can be a real uh, source of discipline and focus. Uh, and it seems to be um, working wonders in your case. Um, tell us a little bit about how fusion uh, and ma magnetic fusion reaction actually works. So strip it down to you know, the basics. Sure. So even backing away from the magnetic part first, mm. what fusion fundamentally is, is it's a nuclear process where you're combining light elements like hydrogen and helium into heavier ones, uh, which the most common reaction is called deuterium-tritium fusion, which are just heavy isotopes or heavy forms of hydrogen that you combine together to make helium and neutrons. It releases a bunch of energy by E equals mc squared, and we can capture that energy to do useful things with, like make heat or make electricity. The other type of nuclear energy is fission power. And that's what all currently operating nuclear reactors on Earth use. And so this is the splitting of really heavy atoms, like uranium or plutonium. And those are into lighter atoms. But the issue with that is that you generate long-term radioactive waste, which is a, a concern with that energy source. Fusion, on the other hand, doesn't have any of those concerns, which is why we like it so much. Now, the input materials for fusion uh, that you said deuterium and tritium in the in the in the most uh, common cases are those difficult to source? Are there any sort of sourcing issues or, or bottlenecks to to get a hold of these input materials? Sure. So deuterium, absolutely not. It's a very plentiful element. Um, in fact, in regular water, it's about one part in 7,000 of molecules in that water has a deuterium. Instead of an H2O, it's like an HDO. Mm -hmm. So we just extract the deuterium from water. And if you look at how much fuel there is on the planet, there is no <laughs> limit to how, how much fuel there is. Tritium, on the other hand, it is a radioactive element that we use and we consume as part of the process, but it has a short half-life. And so that means we have to make it. And so fortunately, we use neutrons that are produced from the fusion reaction itself, combining it with lithium to make the tritium. And mm -hmm. so it's a closed fuel cycle in that sense. 
So in a way, lithium is actually a key raw material uh, for right. fusion. Okay. If you look at the fusion power plant as a, as a big box, the mm -hmm. main inputs are lithium and deuterium, and then the main output is helium and power. Right. So lithium uh, rears its head again as a key element uh, in the energy transition. Um, so tell me a little bit about um, the mass balance. Now, how much material are we talking about to reduce, uh, sorry, to produce, um, you know, several megawatts of, of energy, let's say. So just to get a sense of how much lithium you need to produce a certain amount of energy. Yeah, so fusion is, is very different than fission in the sense that the amount of fuel that's inside of the system at any one time is incredibly small. And the plasma itself is actually, for magnetic fusion, very, very low density. And so to put this into perspective, if you're burning you know, a few millionths of a gram per second, you're converting that fusion fuel into energy via e equals mc squared, that's effectively hundreds of megawatts of power that you can mm. get. And that's just the power of nuclear energy overall. You can get a tremendous amount of energy out with a very small amount of fuel. So one example I like to use is that if you consider powering a city, like Boston, for example, um, if you wanted to power that city, you would have to fill up Fenway Park almost to the brim with coal to do that. Or you fill up half of the back of a pickup truck with fusion fuel to do the same thing. And that's just an explicit example of power density, and in particular, energy density that comes with fusion energy. Right. So we shouldn't worry too much about depleting the world's uh, lithium resources to produce huge amounts of energy. So it, it would take a long, long time to do so. <laughs> yes. In fact, you probably spend a lot more lithium storing the energy that you produce. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> if you're enjoying Impact Unicorns, don't forget to like, subscribe and hit the bell to receive notifications of new shows. Bring the most relevant Impact Venture stories to the podcast. If you would like to review the show, go to the Apple Podcast mobile app or iTunes to leave a rating and review. So another advantage of fusion, which I think is, is quite important, is that there's really not much of a supply chain issue. The, the deuterium is abundant. The lithium, you don't need much of it. Um, talk about the, the sign of, kind of space and volume requirements of one of these reactors. Is it going to take up a lot of land or is it something that you can actually put in small modules or relatively small modules, um, you know, around a city? Yeah, great question. So this is where the difference between energy density and power density come into play. So what we were referring to earlier about the pickup truck and stadium example, that's energy density. That's how, much, how many joules of energy you can release per kilogram of the material that you have. Power density, on the other hand, is how many megawatts of power you can put out per unit volume. And this is what actually impacts the size of the power plant that you're considering. So for a fusion system, most fusion reactors are targeting a power loading on the first wall facing the plasma making the power of around one megawatt per meter squared. So to put that in perspective, a solar panel at the top of Earth's atmosphere is at best getting a incident a power of one kilowatt per meter squared. So it's a, it's a huge amount more power for fusion than, than a solar panel. And correspondingly, that means you need that much less material to make a certain amount of power out. So the footprint is incredibly small. Mm -hmm. It's basically a rounding error for the amount of power that you get out from one of these systems. And projecting forward, when the technology is more commercially viable, uh, what's the minimum scale of power that you would produce from one of these plants to make it economically attractive? Um, and how much physical space would that take? Yeah, that's a great question. So it depends a bit on the type of fusion you're pursuing. Some concepts lend themselves better to smaller power outputs. What I mean by that is below 100 megawatt outputs. Mm. Um, and then there's others that are more geared towards the hundreds of megawatts approaching gigawatt scale. Mm. Going much below 
10 megawatts is quite challenging for fusion because the temperature requirements are a hard requirement for the fusion mm -hmm. reactions to go. And it's as you get smaller, it's just harder and harder to achieve those temperatures in a smaller space. So if we were to look at a 100 megawatt unit, mm -hmm. um, you know, you could envision building a power plant system that's on the order of the size of a, a Target or, or a Costco in total footprint, um, absent you know, other considerations as far as like where you're citing this close to a neighborhood mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. So you could be generating 100 megawatts in a sort of a suburban location, not maybe in a city center that's too dense. You need a bit more space than that. Um, but, you know, it's still in, in many ways a distributed power solution because you can, you know, put these in relatively modest amount of space in a suburban, not even rural location um, and locate it where it's convenient uh, from a physical location standpoint, but also near a source of demand of, it, of the energy. So it's a more distributed footprint than you would have for, let's say, a nuclear fission plant, which tends to be a huge plant, huge capital expenditure, and usually placed very far away from any form of civilization. That's right. And overall, the private fusion industry, I would say, is exclusively focused on that more distributed model. And I think everyone, I can't think of anyone who's not, is all pursuing like hundreds of megawatts units. There's mm -hmm. no one proposing building gigawatt power plants. And that just comes from the demand. When we talk to, to utilities and other power producers around the world, it seems like the demand is moving towards that model, which is driven by mostly renewables, um, instead of building these giant, you know, multi gigawatt scale power plants like we did in the past. And how does uh, the model of fusion compare with the SMR uh, paradigm in fission? So these sort of smaller modular reactors, are they more comparable? And how is fusion going to compare with SMR in the future as competing sources of energy? Yeah, so they're much closer in their, um, I guess, their spec sheet as far as how much power they're targeting. And also SMRs, the first letter is small modular reactor. And so they're trying to go in the direction of smaller footprint systems towards a distributed model as well, um, which is great for fission in my book. The caveat to that is that they're still fission systems. And so though they can be designed to be very safe, um, you still have the issues of the potential for safety concerns like meltdowns because it is a nuclear chain reaction and you still generate long-lived radioactive waste that must be dealt with. Those two big issues with fission are not present in fusion. There's no chain reaction in fusion, so there's zero risk of a meltdown, and there's no long-lived radioactive waste as part of the process. And so when we're comparing and contrasting, if we can get fusion to work at the right price point, we think it'll be a superior product to SMRs. And you mentioned safety. Um, some people may have the impression that fusion is actually quite dangerous because the temperatures are so high, higher than the temperature of the sun, I believe. Um, explain how that's not uh, a safety concern and also maybe not even a concern when it comes to cooling the reactor down because there's some interesting physics at play here, I think. Yeah, so, it quite, so at first glance, um, the temperature requirements for fusion, so for example, for deuterium tritium fusion, it's around 150 million degrees, which is so high of a number, you don't actually have to worry if that's Celsius or Kelvin. Um, it doesn't really matter. Um, but what's kind of counterintuitive is that for a magnetic fusion reactor, which is what we're interested in, um, the density of the plasma at that high temperature is incredibly small. We're talking, talking about a, around a million times less dense than air, if not even less dense than that. So if you add up actually how much energy, thermal energy is behind the plasma, there's actually not that much. And so if you were to take like a pin and throw it into a fusion plasma, it would shut off the system very rapidly because the amount of mass that's cold in this pin is more than the entire energy of the plasma when it's making hundreds of megawatts of power. 
And so it's a robustly safe system that's entirely driven. The minute that you shut off the input power and you, and you want to turn this off, it shuts off like that. And it really is off when you turn it off. Over the past 20 years, I've worked with hundreds of entrepreneurs to build impact unicorns. In my experience, every company that has a transformative positive effect on the world does so by building strong partnerships with communities, investors and governments to solve society's biggest challenges. If you'd like to learn more about how innovative entrepreneurs can help to build a more sustainable and inclusive future, read my award-winning book, Powering Prosperity, A Citizen's Guide to Shaping the 21st Century. Isn't science cool? It so is. <laughs> we're talking about a reaction chamber that's the size of a target. Inside it is almost nothing because this plasma is so um, not dense, a millionth of the, the density of air. Um, and it's at a huge temperature, but even with a small amount of matter, because of E equals MC squared, it's able to produce a huge amount of energy and, and power and basically provide a, a, a distributed energy solution that can be steady base load. It's always producing and mitigate some of the intermittency that we would have from wind and solar when it's widely deployed in the future. So in some ways, the perfect foil, perfect safe foil, for solar and wind renewables in the grid in the future. Yes. And so we view fusion as working in concert with renewables like wind and solar to provide a completely decarbonized energy solution. And that goes beyond electricity as well. We're also focused on high-grade industrial process heat and synthetic fuel production like hydrogen and ammonia. And there's all these other use cases that we need to use fusion um, in order to decarbonize. It's a very challenging problem when you look beyond just electricity. Yes, I think it would be an elegant and incredibly important contribution if we can get there in a, in a decade or a couple of decades. One thing that we haven't talked about, which is perhaps the key thing, the energy balance. So talk about the, the concept of net gain and where the industry is in, in reaching that, uh, that landmark uh, level of net gain equals one. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So when answering this, I tend to start at the commercial because in the end, that's what actually matters <laughs> in a real sense. Um, and so in the end, your goal is to produce net power to the grid. And so you're wanting to get more watts to the grid than it takes to watts in to keep the system going. And that includes all of the other efficiency considerations, power conversion cycles, everything. That is the metric of success. Right now, we have not demonstrated that um, as a community since there hasn't been a system designed to put watts onto the grid. That being said, as we build back away from that ultimate goal, there are a series of milestones we have to hit. And the concept of net gain is one of those really important, you know, basically technical viability milestones that you have to hit to, in order to continue to progress towards the commercial milestones later on. Um, and so what this concept is, is that the input power to the plasma needs, the power output from the plasma from fusion needs to be bigger than the input power to the plasma to keep it going. And when that ratio is exactly equal to one, that's where the concept of net gain comes from. If that answers your question. And where are we in that journey towards net gain of one? Because I guess that's the, the threshold beyond which you know, commercial viability comes into closer view. Right. So to answer that, it's a bit more complicated than it looks. Um, so you might have heard recently uh, some announcements from the National Ignition Facility in, um, in California, which seem to suggest that they're very close to ignition, which ignition in a rigorous sense means when the gain goes to infinity, the system becomes self-sustaining. Um, what's interesting about uh, that result is that it shows that their power balance from the, their pulse system 
works very well. In fact, they did hit net gain and how they define that. But from a commercial standpoint, they're still not close to net gain when you take into account the efficiencies involved. For the branch of fusion I'm in, magnetic fusion, um, there has been experiments in the past that have demonstrated you know, tens of megawatts of fusion power in getting close to net gain, meaning like gains of 0.6 to 0.8. Um, but to date, we haven't had the clear net gain demonstration for that branch of fusion either. That being said, there's a series of fusion companies, including ourselves, that are pursuing that. And I believe some of the earliest timescales for that are 2023 and 2025 for demonstrating net gain for the first time. Hmm. And then from there, how much more time do you think the industry would need to get to commercial viable um, product? You're asking me the hard question. So in an ideal world um, where we can fully parallelize development, I think you could see the first you know, grid-connected uh, fusion power plants in the 2030s. I think that's plausible. Um, the issue with that is actually the implementation and getting the approvals to do so and ensuring the technology is at a readiness level that a customer is willing to buy it. Um, mm. So I know that ourselves and many other companies are targeting the 2030s. Mm -hmm. I think that's likely the earliest that we'll see fusion power on the grid. And what's special about the approach that you're taking at CT Fusion technologically? Sure. So our, as I mentioned, we're in the branch of fusion called magnetic fusion energy. Um, there's various concepts within that branch, including ourselves. And the main thing that you're trading off is how you make the magnetic fields you need for confinement of a plasma. And in general, you have two options. You can make them with external superconducting coils, or you can make it with electrical currents flowing in the plasma itself. It turns out that plasmas are actually fantastic electrical conductors when they get hot. Mm. Um, and so you can actually flow current in the plasma itself to confine itself. Um, and so, for example, our approach uses plasma currents much, much more heavily than external superconductors, which we think if we can show it scales up to higher temperatures, it'll be a much more compact and simple approach than something like a tokamak or stellarator, which more heavily uses those external superconducting coils. And would that have an impact on the cost of your system relative to the superconducting version? Yes, so compact and simplicity tend to be drivers of lower costs. Our calculations suggest that that is indeed the case. Um, but of course, you know, as we progress forward, our cost estimates get more refined as we get more precise with our operational specifications. But in short, yes, you know, size and complexity drives up costs generally and, com and compactness and simplicity drives down costs. Awesome. So what are the plans for the next year? It sounds as though you know, you've got a clear path ahead of you. You know what you need to do. What are the immediate priorities? So currently we're finishing a series of projects that have been funded by RPE, which is the uh, Advanced Research Project Agency uh, line from the Department of Energy. So this is a, a U.S. government funded uh, set of contracts. And so we're, we've hit some milestones that we've already set out to do earlier this year, which we're really excited about. And so now we're going into the next phase of milestones to hit, which sets a series of performance goals for our existing prototype. Looking beyond that publicly funded project, then we're looking to move into the proof of concept, which will be a scale up in size and performance of our system to show indeed that our technology does scale up towards plasmas that are more analogous to what you would have in an eventual commercial system. And in that next uh, phase, are you attempting to hit that net gain uh, milestone by 2023 to 25? No, so our next step is, is not a net gain demonstration. It's more of an, an intermediate step to show that our, our system scales so that we have the data to then say confidently, we need to build this size machine with this <clears throat> specification to hit net gain to follow. And that's how we think about optimizing for risk, cost, and time. Got it. Well, phenomenal. What a fascinating conversation. 
Derek, um, I, I think uh, this is uh, an area that we could speak about for hours and go deeper and deeper, but let's leave uh, the, that to the next installment because I think there's a lot to take in already and a uh, super exciting field that uh, I'm sure we'll try to revisit and uh, perhaps we will get you on in, in a few months from now and see how things are going. So it's great to have you on the show. Thank you so Thanks much for your time. If you've enjoyed this episode of Impact Unicorns, don't forget to rate and review this show by scrolling down and clicking Rate This Podcast. And join me next week as I talk to more inspirational entrepreneurs building the next generation of transformative companies.